Hello. I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today about the coming of the Lord and looking through, looking through the eyes of various biblical characters to do that. And I've chosen the Old Testament prophet, Isaiah. He lived through really challenging and we might say dark times. Uh, Israel wasn't in a great spiritual state and a lot of his prophetic work was around judgment that was coming. Uh, captivity and exile in, into Babylon. And yet, interpersed amongst all the prophecies of judgment was great hope um, for the future. And and his book is interesting in the sense is that it's a long book, it's 66 chapters, which um, coincidentally corresponds with the numbers of books in the Bible. And like the Bible, it also seems to have a division in the middle of the first 39 chapters deal with um, leading up to the captivity in Babylon. And then the next 27, um, in a sense, look at some restoration after that time. Um, the 40th chapter, like which equivalent to the Gospel of Matthew, which is the 40th book in the Bible, um, begins with the word comfort, and it talks about good news. It talks about God coming. It talks about preparing the way for the Lord. Um, but the first part, the first um, 39 chapters, as I mentioned, of uh, a judgment also paint a picture of, of a king. And, and I'm briefly going to touch on that, but I just want my major focus to be on the, the outline of Christ revealed in, in, in the second part. But in the first part, the focus of Isaiah is on this king who is coming. Uh, maybe the first reference is to the child in Isaiah 7, uh, where he talks about the virgin shall be with child and you shall call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. But then it, in chapter 9, in, in the well-known passages, he talks about another or the same special child, if you like. Um, a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and upon his shoulders uh, the government will rest. And he talks about him being the Prince of Peace, the wonderful the everlasting father, the wonderful counsellor, uh, and of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. These are scriptures you know well, and each Christmas they are faithfully read. And then in chapter 11, he talks again about this ideal king, this perfect ruler, uh, with the spirit of the Lord is upon him, the spirit of fear, uh, the fear of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding and, and, and counsel and might. And he refers this king to being of, this, of, of the root of Jesse, in other words, from David's line. And he says he won't uh, judge uh, by what his eyes see or what his ears hear, but he'll judge righteously and he'll give good justice uh, for the poor and for the needy. So we see in the first 39 books the, the outline of this, uh, of this king. Then we get to the 40th chapter. And so the message changes. The 39th deals with a kind of judgment that they're going into Babylon, but 40 begins with these wonderful words of comfort. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And uh, it talks about um, the good news being proclaimed. It talks about God coming. It talks about Israel's sin being paid for. But how is that to be accomplished? It, it, it doesn't say at that point. What is revealed, if you like, in the second part of Isaiah, from 40 to 66, is of a person who will come and do the will of God. And this person isn't described as a king, but he's described as a servant. And I think in seeing this picture of the Lord Jesus as a, the servant of God, I think that can stir our hearts to to, to want to serve God, to, to, to want to emulate, to be like him, to um, be someone who delights in, in doing and, and the will of God. So the main passage I want us to look at is actually Isaiah 42, and it's just four verses, verses 1 to 4. And it's the first of what's called five of five servant songs. So it's songs about the servant of the Lord. And I'm going to major on the first one and just touch a little bit on, on the others in, in closing. 
But verse 42, Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 4 says these words, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout out or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. Isaiah says, here is my servant. Or as the new King James says, behold my servant. Take note, this is my servant. This is the one in whom I delight. He's my chosen one, I'll put my spirit on him. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament that the early church read, as quoted in Matthew's Gospel, it says these words, Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I'll put my spirit on him. That's Matthew twelve eighteen. It's hard not to see the connection between those words in Isaiah and the words God spoke at the baptism of Jesus. And I quote Matthew 3, verse 4. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I'll put my Spirit upon him. This is how God determined to do his work. It's the seal of God to put his spirit upon his servant. It's the declaration of God that this is the one in whom he delights, that he loves him, that he's well pleased with him. In many ways he's saying, this one fully represents me. He has my seal upon him. If you see him, you'll see me. I'm sure many of you have seen the connection between uh, these words at Jesus' baptism in Isaiah 42. But if you haven't, you may have missed it because Isaiah uses the word servant, whereas Matthew uses the word son. And recently, I suppose, the church has made much of the difference between a servant and a son. We think of a servant as someone who is serving out of duty or obligation, uh, maybe for pay. And we see the son as someone who serves for love because he is the heir and he serves to honour his father. But this servant that Isaiah speaks of uh, clearly is not a hired hand. No one expresses a delight or love for a servant who is a hired hand. This servant has the higher distinction of a servant who seeks the honour of the one who sent him. He is truly the son who serves his father, worthy of double honour, as Malachi comments in Malachi 3.17. And, and this theology of Jesus being the servant of God had, had a deep impression on the Apostle Paul. In the wonderful description in Philippians 2 that Paul describes Jesus as being in the very nature God, uh, but didn't think equality of God something to be grasped, um, but humbled himself. And, and then he goes on to say he took the form of a servant in Philippians 2, 7. And, and being a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient. Servants obey. And it was Jesus' joy to obey. And, and if you like, we long so much for the heart of the Son that has intimacy and relationship. But the heart of this Son, which also had intimacy and relationship, uh, had obedience and, and submission and loving submission written all over it. And in wanting and seeking to become more like Jesus, we want that relationship and that knowledge of God, but we do pray so much that our hearts would be humbled, that there would be a willing heart, obedience and reverence for God. And we see this so clearly in the servant songs 
of Jesus. And we see how this heart yieldedness to the Father so delighted him. And Jesus modelled this true servanthood, this true humility when he said, I'm among you as the one who serves in Luke twenty two twenty seven, And in John six thirty eight, he says these words, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If we look at Isaiah 42 and the mission of the servant, the objective, if you will, of the servant, it's truly remarkable. It's to bring justice to the nations in verse 1. In verse 3, he says, in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. And in verse 4, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. So the mission of God's servant was to bring justice. Now, we think of justice in a number of ways, and, and none of those are wrong. In fact, they're all right and speak into this. We, we think of it as ensuring that right is done and that wrongs are exposed and punished, and that's a perfectly good way of seeing justice. We see justice as a means of fairness. We see it as a means of equal-handedness. <clears throat> we see it as treating everyone the same way with dignity and respect and honour and value, uh, equal opportunity, uh, equal recognition, if you like, um, provision of care and shelter. And all of these do reflect this concept of justice. But when it says Jesus, his mission is to bring justice to the nations, I think there's something deeper and, and broader in the meaning of justice here. Um, it's true that all that I've said above is about justice, but there is a sense that justice is about setting things right, setting them things in the order, in the right order, the way that they were intended to be. This is the one who will set things right, my servant. He will bring righteousness. Righteousness is being in a right relationship and in an Old Testament terms, it's right relationship with God. It's demonstrating the character of God, which is righteousness. And, and justice is the operation that outworks righteousness. So by bringing justice to the nations, Jesus is bringing the character, the purpose, and the person of God to the nations. It basically means bringing everything into conformity with what they ought to be, to establish it according to the right standard. In, in biblical terms, it would mean conforming to the character of God, or as Jesus prayed, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. So it's the action of bringing about a state of right relationship, right character in conformity with the will and purpose and knowledge and plan of God. It's about making all things new. And again, the, the Apostle Paul caught hold of this, um, of the purpose of the Son of God. And I just want to read to you from Colossians 1, 19, where he says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, and through him to reconcile him to himself all things, things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So that is the mission of the servant. It's reconciling all things to God. And that's what he meant by bringing justice to the nations. It's bringing the nations back into line with the will and counsel and purpose of God. What a mission. What a servant. And Paul says these words, and, and Isaiah says these words, he won't be discouraged or falter uh, until he does it. Interestingly, it goes on to say, he, he, you know, he won't cry out, he won't raise his voice in the streets. Um, 
he's not going to bring attention to himself. His whole purpose is not self-proclamation, but to glorify the one who sent him. That's what servants do. It's not, they don't come in their own name. They come in the name of the one who sent them. And his mission is not to break the bruised reed or to put out the smouldering wicks. So he will care for each one, each individual in such a perfect way. Even though his mission is to the, gen is to the nations, his purpose is to restore each individual. What a beautiful picture of this servant. Now, Isaiah draws the curtain back in, in the remaining servant songs, and I'm briefly going to touch on them. The second servant song identifies the, the develops the identity and the work of this chosen servant. And then the third song, which I'm just going to read to you, um, tells of the obedience and intimacy of this servant. I want you to remember a servant is the one who is tuned in to the will of the one who sent him. He's not come on his own. He's come to do the will. So Isaiah 50 verse nine, 5 to 9 says these words. The sovereign Lord, this is Jesus speaking through the mouth of the, by the Spirit through the mouth of uh, Isaiah. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ears to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. I've not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It's the sovereign Lord who helps me, who will condemn me. They all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. I'm sure you recognise some of that. As the Apostle Paul developed this passage into the great truth in Romans 8, who will bring... Um, a charge against God's elect. It's Christ who justifies. Who is there to condemn? As Christ was fully vindicated by the being raised from the dead, so we in him are also vindicated, made right, and there's no condemnation to those in Christ. So if the second and the third servant song pulled the curtain back on the stage, the fourth song has us looking in onto the stage and seeing uh, the person, as it were, revealed. Isaiah 52, 13 says these words, See, my servant. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And just as there was many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness so he will sprinkle many nations kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were not told they will see and what they had not heard they will understand this servant of the lord was marred beyond human likeness and yet and yet, he will be raised. And then Isaiah asks those reading, those hearing a question in chapter 53, verse 1. He says, who has believed our message? And down the corridors of time, he's asking you and me that same question. Have you believed this message? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is another word, is it not, for the servant of God? To whom has the servant of God been revealed? So in Isaiah's words, 
this servant, this chosen one, this loved one, this upheld one, this yielded one, this obedient one, this instructed one, this disfigured one, this beaten one, this spat upon one, this mocked one. He's been vindicated. He's been raised up. He has been exalted. And he will sprinkle many nations. Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. And the Holy Spirit, through him, says to us, Behold my servant. Will you believe his message? Thank you.